Our final speaker here actually does not really need an introduction, as he is, is literally one of the most respected and admired leaders in software. Uh, Jay Simons is the current president of Atlassian, where he's been uh, for roughly a decade. Uh, when he joined in 2008 as their first head of sales and marketing, the company really didn't have a, um, a sales and marketing function. Um, and he uh, invented the, and really kind of architected and led the uh, high velocity, low touch sales model that I could argue is the envy of most software companies around the world. And it's not an exaggeration to say that many companies, most modern software companies in particular, are looking to emulate that approach as they start to scale their businesses. Um, under Jay's leadership, the business has grown now to roughly a $20 billion publicly traded company. Uh, and prior to joining Atlassian, Jay spent a decade uh, in various sales roles at uh, Plumtree, BEA, and Oracle, if I got it right. So please join me in welcoming Jay to the stage. Thank you. Now you can come up. Deja vu. <laughs> I had to embarrass you. Um, so Jay, one of the, the great things about Atlassian is that you got, you getting blinded? No, it's okay. You're it's all right. right. Yeah. Okay. Um, is, is you guys have had such an unconventional approach to success. And you know, investors are very simple minded. And we have these rule books or these kind of playbooks that we like to to think about as we, as we work with our entrepreneurs and help kind of pattern match the things that we've seen historically and said, okay, do this one thing, that should work for you. The sales model, this product approach, we'll touch on a lot of these things. Uh, but what Atlassian done, what I think is so interesting and we'll, we'll walk through are just the, the number of decisions you guys made over time that were really non-obvious but have yielded just incredible results for the company. So hopefully during the course of our discussion, we'll, we'll touch on some of these. But let's, um, let's start with culture. Um, Atlassian, my sense, has a very kind of um, uh, non-traditional culture. And so how would you define Atlassian's culture? Uh, what are your values? Um, how do you... Uh, kind of manifest them on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure they're really tangible and that they they kind of exist in in the, the employees' lives. Yeah. So uh, I, I've always described Atlassian's culture as you know Atlassian is a company that is serious but doesn't take itself too seriously, and um, I love that about it. Like I think when you're when you're there and if you meet Atlassians, um, I think they're very earnest and dedicated to building the company and doing what we can to scale, but. Uh, they're uh, also lighthearted and fun, and um, you know the company. I think his uh, one of our values is build with heart and balance, and so I think we care a lot about um, you know the, the the flip side of being serious and, and motivated to to, to build a, a company and continue to, to uh, shape it and scale it. Um, you know, foundational I think in the culture was uh, was was establishing the company's values to begin with. And I think a lot of companies talk about this. You know, we ripped a page out of the Jim Collins Good to Great book. Uh, and if, if you haven't read that book, he talks about this exercise of, of colonizing you know, a, another planet, colonizing Mars, and who in your company would be your colony team, your advanced team to go find out whether or not you could settle somewhere else. And so uh, we did that exercise when we established the company's values, and we had the leadership team at the time uh, uh, basically brainstorm what, what we felt the value system of the company would be and what the company stood for. And then we had this colony team, a separate group of employees, do the same thing. And they tended to be t that colony, t people we identified as, as culture carriers. And we were uh, maybe about 80 people at the time uh, and probably about five years old. And uh, part of the reason we wanted to do that was um, was because we wanted a foundation that we could use to attract new Atlassians, and we wanted to codify what we stood for and what we believed in. And maybe the thing that we did that it was a little unconventional was, uh, you know, we laced them with profanity. And, and part of that is, <laughs> part of that is, I think, uh, our Australian heritage. Uh, you know, are there any Australians in the room? I don't want to offend anybody. Um, so forgive the, if there's one. Forgive the generalization, but you guys are taught to swear like at a very early age. Am I right? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, you know, we wanted them to be raw and authentic, and I, and I think as a result they really resonated. And maybe one funny story about that is so one of them is um, one of the values is don't fuck the customer, and the idea behind that is put the customer first. And you know we're going to be as a as a company will constantly face uh, really hard decisions. Um, where you know we we in in some of those cases you know we could be doing harm to the customer or prioritizing sort of ourselves first and, and the customer last and so really put the customer at the table and think about them and and you know in the lobby of of our Australian headquarters this value was was spelled out in three foot uh, tall letters 
uh, and there was an interview room just adjacent to the lobby, and so like every new candidate would come in and see, don't F-U-C-K, the customer. And you know, some, would, some were offended. Some were like, why is there the F word sort of like in the lobby of your, of your, uh, of your office? And on one level, it was a good filter, because uh, if people were offended by that, they probably was maybe not the right, the right place for them. But the funny twist on that story is, is uh, you know, in, in everywhere on the website and all of our literature, we, we, we didn't want to neuter the word because we felt like, you know, all of a sudden it's, it, it loses its meaning and everybody can basically spell the F word with, you know, exclamation points and asterisks until uh, some of us had kids that were old enough to read that would come, <laughs> come visit us at the office and sort of changed our, uh, or changed the way we felt about it. So now when you look at our values, uh, you know, we, we use symbols. But, um, but I think, you know, those core values sort of helped us attract, you know, the other thing we did is, you know, we talked about them externally. And the reason that we did that is because we wanted uh, the value system, something that was really core, we spent a lot of time designing it, to, to be an attractant for people that were gonna come into the building. And that really worked. I mean, we, we sort of became known early on for having this unconventional, quirky you know, set of values. We had web pages that described them, which is not uncommon. And people you know, would apply for jobs at the company because those things, like open company, I'll list them for you, open yeah. company, no bullshit. I listed the DFTC one, play as a team, uh, build with heart and balance, and then be the change you seek, are sort of the four kind of critical core values of the company. And, and then the last part of your question that I'll shut up is, um, is you know, we talk about them. They, be, they, become, uh, they become the way that Atlassian solve problems. Uh, they become sort of a reference point when people have to make hard decisions. They're really used. And I think because we established them early on, it's just become the center of gravity in the company now that when new people come in and they're part of a decision or part of a project, so many people, even though we've, we've grown really quickly, so many people are there where it's part of their language, it's part of the way they talk about things, that people get kind of indoctrinated to the values. First of all, they're attractive, but they, it becomes part of then how they, they know that, that we operate as the company. Are, are there best practices in terms of training somebody on the way in around the values, recognizing them throughout the journey, terminating people that don't live by them? Are there things you guys have done over time that tuned it so that it really kind of becomes part of their DNA? Uh, so we, we, they're, they're part of every new, new hire's uh, general onboarding. And maybe the one thing that we learned uh, kind of a little bit later is that, that they really are, they form a system. And uh, where we've, um, you know, where, where we become imbalanced around them is sometimes new employees won't understand that it's a system. And they'll use a single value as a blunt instrument. So they'll say, uh, Hey, open company, you know, so maybe somebody will be really critical, critical about, uh, about a, a colleague's work. And then they'll say, well, open company, no bullshit. I can tell you that sucks. It sucks. And what they're missing is that there's another value play as a team that needs to be combined with you know, the spirit of openness and candor and, and you know, even critical feedback. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that's the, the reminder as part of the onboarding is they aren't blunt instruments. Because you can take any, any one of them and, and use it to squash something. But sure. I think the weight of all of them together maybe forces you to consider things a little bit differently. Have there been times where there's tension, where you guys had to make a decision that may have been optimal in the short run, but put pressure on one of the values and kind of tested your, your conviction with it? Yeah, always. I, I mean, I think. Uh, you know, even most recently, uh, you know, we, we, we chose to um, exit the real-time communication space and yeah. um, end of life uh, a product and divest part of that to Slack. Uh, and, you know, that was some of you maybe customers of that HipChat and, and Stride. And that's a really hard thing because, you know, there are, um, there are customers that basically made bets on that particular product with us that shows it over uh, a bunch of alternatives. And uh, on one level, you know, you're letting them down. And so like, there's a big spirited debate around, hey, this violates that, that one particular value. But again, when you look at it in isolation, there's potentially holding on to that particular product and choosing to invest in it over other things that we could make better for other customers uh, applies kind of the equal outcome to those other customers that aren't using it. Uh, and then we need to do, you know, the, 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 the healthier the company is in the long term, the better it is for all customers. And so ultimately that's where, you know, we have that discussion all the time. And I think, you know, that was a, that was a proud moment for us because it, it, that decision, you know, it is very, it's very hard to stop a product. And uh, it's much harder to stop than to stop something than to start something. But 
uh, I think it was a real test of the value system, a test of, of how the company thinks long term, and, and uh, you know, I think a proud moment for us to get through. Yeah. So talk about the early days when you and I were, were talking recently. You shared a bunch of interesting stories about some decisions you guys made around monetization in the early days. And this, I think, set the stage for kind of the, the high velocity, kind of low friction sales model. And, and from an investor's perspective, when um, we're looking for you know, revenue, we go hire salespeople, we go sell to the enterprise, and that's kind of our default <coughs> go-to move. And you guys, you know, counterintuitively did the exact opposite to obviously great success. So what were some of the things that were going on 10 years ago when you joined that kind of forced you guys down that path? Well, I'll tell you, like uh, now our, our kind of approach to pricing and, uh, and, and sort of uh, sizing our TAM and, and kind of exploring our market over time looks genius. Yeah. Uh, and it, part of it was intentional. A lot of it was it a has bunch evolved, of accidents, uh, has evolved basically. over time. Yeah, uh, fortuitous accidents. <laughs> but you know, the, the f first, the first, our, our flagship product is a product called Jira. Ho hopefully, there's a lot of you that use it. Uh, and Jira, when it was first introduced, was had one price, 800 bucks. 800 bucks basically supported all the users that you wanted to use and, and every feature that was in that first version of Jira. That was it. And um, and the reason that we did that is, is in part, at the time, we were competing against uh, free open source alternatives. So Jira was replacing uh, things like Bugzilla and Track and Redmine and kind of open source issue and bug track trackers. Uh, and so we needed to be, you know, we needed to be cheap in order to convince somebody uh, to move off something that was free. That was part of it. Um, the other part of it is that we just, we believed uh, and I wasn't there at the time, but that, be that belief was pretty resonant and still is resonant, that we believed that this was a product that actually any single company could use. Um, they may not be ready for it. They might not be mature enough to use it. Uh, they might not be fed up with whatever alternative they're using, but they're, they are a candidate for this particular, particular thing. And, uh, and so because of that, like the, the, we sized the TAM by units. Like how many total companies are in the market that we could sell to, and that was massive. And then we used price basically as, as the way to remove friction. So just that, that flat price. And then over time, uh, we have basically added increased price on customers in the form of additional tiers. And so now there is an additional features. So now there's a version of Jira that you can spend a half a million dollars a year on. And it is, uh, it is a... Uh, you know, version of Jira that's architected to, to, to run across a number of physical nodes, and you know, if you've got 50,000 people that, that manage Jira at, at LG Electronics, uh, you care about that particular architecture, super valuable. Um, and, uh, but for customers that basically began with that 800 user, user version, we would introduce a new tier. We would say, well, now there's not an unlimited user tier. There is a, one, there is a 100 uh, and below tier and a 100 and above tier. And the 100 and above tier is $1,600, is just an example. And so the customer would have to declare, okay, I have more than 100 users. And, and so we sort of packaged this evolution of the pricing model over time. And it allowed us to participate in more value with customers that had been using us for a while and got incredible value. And, uh, and then, you know, have, have kind of a a way to sort of enter organizations, grow with them, and then participate uh, in, in more value over time. And, uh, you know, but if you look at our pricing models now, still we are hyper aggressive at the bottom end. You know, ten, a 10 user license of any of our products is, is 10 bucks, basically, or a dollar a month in the cloud. I mean, it's like, it's super cheap. So talk about in the early days when there weren't, and I think that the popular mythology is like Atlassian literally has no sales reps. And I know that's not true. I know there are people that actually sell stuff at Atlassian. But in the early days, there really wasn't. And you were forced, because there wasn't any sales reps, to focus on kind of the SMB market and, and adopt a very different motion as a business. Talk about those days and what, what kind of the fact that the lack of any salespeople around, the lack of that kind of perspective, what... What lessons you guys learned and what, what muscles that forced you guys to develop? Like one forcing function is, you know, we, we're an Australian company started in Australia. And so, you know, we wanted to sell the rest of the, the biggest part of the market was not in Australia. It was somewhere else. And, uh, you know, we, we were founded in 2002. And so a lot of this is sort of head naughty now. But, you know, it was uh, basically the introduction of search engine marketing and AdWords. The Internet became a way that you could distribute software. Um, 
uh, you know, the cloud was still early, and so we were shipping, you know, behind the, like on-premises software that, that people installed. But we believed that, you know, this was a little bit pre, pre my time, but we believed that, you know, we could reach customers, we could remove friction, we could help customers find this, this product, uh, try it, decide whether they want to buy it, and if they do, make it so affordable uh, and so easy for them to buy on their own that they will. And actually, like most people, if you, if you, I think most, most of us as consumers, if you, you put, put yourself in the consumer mindset, that's true. You know, like if we, if, if you go into a store, you buy a car, if you can do all that stuff on your own and you get your questions answered easily and you understand it's like super simple to buy, that's actually like most of us want to be in that, that situation. And I think a lot of B2B buyers too. Uh, buyers do as well. And so uh, part of it was just a belief that a re we remove, fr remove friction and made it easy that we could, reach, uh, we could reach customers that way, and then we did. And the, the other sort of key think, ingredient in, into, into how the model developed is, you know, we sell to the team. And so, like, I think if, if I were, if, if, I, if, if you're a company that basically has, you know, our model wouldn't work for, for a work day. It, you know, or for like a general ledger sister system where you're going to have one of them and it's sort of like it's a very carefully crafted decision that, that some senior executive is going to make and it's very big and expensive uh, and you make it once and then you're done. Uh, we sell team software. And so even in the biggest companies, pick Exxon as an example, Exxon can start with a 10 user team, could, could today start with Jira and just get going. And so even in the largest, the largest enterprises, the model works to, to enter and land. Mm -hmm. And then we've just invested a lot of energy in things like you know, product growth and, and focusing on like what are the expansion paths in product? What could the product do that a, a sales rep would do or a sales engineer would do to better onboard that first 10 user team, to figure out how to nudge per people towards the second product or the third product? Um, to ha how to how to nudge somebody to invite another adjacent team so we can get that user expansion, and and we just really focus a lot of energy, time, and money and thinking to replicating what people would do in a normal situation inside of the product to basically get scale. Got it. So the, the the bias is if there's any point along the journey where the product can kind of drive the sale, let's do that as opposed to potentially. You know, having the rep. Yeah, and and if you if, if back to pricing, just the economics didn't would never make sense for us to hire a sales organization. Like it, it you know, the ASP even today, the 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 ASP for a particular customer in a given year, on average, over everybody that we sell to, is thirty five hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And uh, and even in the case of Exxon. Uh, no, Exxon could, this is where it gets a little unconventional. Like, if I see Exxon, like the natural B2B motion is, oh shit, it's Exxon, and they've started a trial for 10 users, S you know, send in the squadron, get them going, because that 10 users can turn into 10,000. So, like, we want to spend all this time, you know, kind of working the account so we can, you know, we can cross fertilize all these different departments and teams and, and make the deal bigger. And we don't do that at all. We just believe that, nope, get out of their way, leave them alone, let them know that we're, we're going to help them land that 10 user uh, that 10 user team successfully and all the things that I just mentioned about you know pointing them at different products or, or you know getting kind of viral expansion paths in the product those are going to kick in over time and and over time we will go from 10 to a thousand to ten thousand from one product to six products from a standard product to a premium product and we you know we'll eventually get to that share of wallet maybe a little bit later but we can we can afford to, to uh, wait and grow into that and the counterpoint is if we throw a bunch of people at exxon they could spend a bunch of time and still only end up with a 10 user deal you know yeah. like or a 100 user deal that's three grand and we would have lost a lot of money so when did you guys start to hire salespeople, and what what triggered that decision on your part and what what role did they have to fill where the product uh bias wasn't able to to do the entire journey, but you need to actually a human in the middle to help out. So we've had, uh, we have always had a, a what, what I think of as re reactive pre-sales people. We call them product advocates. And basically, if you try any one of our products, we'll send you an email that says we're stoked that you're you're here trying the product. Do you really say stoked? Uh, I, I don't know, okay. no, no, probably not. But we say we're excited. We're genuinely excited. And if there's anything that we could do, uh, we will bend over backwards to help you. If not, we leave you alone. Right. And, uh, and so that people opt into that. They're like, yeah, I've got questions. I'm comparing you to this and I want to know if you do this feature. And, um, 
really early on, people would say, I, I want to discount. And now I think for the most part, the market understands that we don't, we don't discount. Like the price, is the, the price is what the price is. But that, we've had that reactive customer success, customer service team. Uh, and their job and the way they're measured is on volume. And they're measured on CSAT. So we give you a great, the, their goal is I give you a great answer to a question. And I let you know that you can come back to me anytime you want. But otherwise, there's no tickler. I don't check back with you. I don't, you know, I don't ask if you're the budget holder. Like, I don't have a quota. I'm measured on CSAT and volume. That's it. We have a channel, which is very important. And we've had it. We're a very channel-friendly business because we don't have a traditional sales organization. But the channel tends to work to remove friction in places that we're not or in markets that are a little bit uncomfortable with that self-service online kind of e-commerce buying motion. And so if I'm in uh, Thailand, you know, potentially I want to talk to somebody who speaks Thai. Um, they tend to be boutique services organizations, but they do resell. And they are, you know, they tend to also uh, orient more on, on kind of larger enterprises because there's more complexity there. Um, but that's a really important part of the sales motion, that indirect sales channel. And then to answer your question, we introduced a premium uh, version of our behind the firewall product about three and a half years ago. And uh, we sort of deferred doing a bunch of things at really large companies that had, that had grown to you know, use, use our products to support five or 10,000 users. They asked us for a bunch of stuff. And we kept on saying no, like we're, we're not going to do those things. We're just kind of deferring them uh, for a while because we were focused on kind of the scale and kind of volume and, and uh, breadth over depth. And when we finally invested in those features, we, we wanted to price those features at a premium. And we weren't quite sure whether or not customers would pay that. So on average, you would pay for 10,000 users you know, 36 grand for a single Jira instance. And this, this version that we call data center, uh, you could you deploy over multiple nodes. That would be 360 grand. So it's sort of a, t a 10x increase. It has a whole bunch of things that are really important to you if you're using us to support tens of thousands of people. So we took some of those product advocates and we said, we want you to, before we put this on the web, and, and, and make it kind of an automated touchless sale. We want you to call into all these customers that we know have 5,000 users and let them know that it's here. And kind of the upgrade path is going to be this pretty significant price jump to understand whether or not we had the pricing right. And uh, we called, we shifted those people around, called them enterprise advocates. Uh, and they called into all these accounts and said, hey, I've got this thing that we think you're interested in. You're running this. It should be mission critical. Uh, it's not uh, architected to be mission critical. This one is, all that sort of stuff. And once we found out that we actually like, had that kind of product market fit and sort of like we got the pricing right, uh, then we've scaled that. So, so that team today, Enterprise Advocates, which is the, which is the closest proxy to a sales, sales team uh, inside of Atlassian. We're 3,000 people. There are 20 of them, yeah. 22 of them, just to give you an order of magnitude. And what they still do today is they call into really, really big high value accounts where we know there's active usage with thousands of people. And they try to nudge those customers towards that premium upgrade path. Um, and so it's an expansion kind of upgrade uh, motion. Um, the thing that we've been religious about holding on to, which I think makes a huge difference in our business, is uh, those uh, enterprise advocates, in fact, nobody in our business can discount, um, nor can they uh, negotiate terms and conditions. Hmm. So every customer signs the same license agreement. They ask us if they can do a bunch of stuff, and we've just said no consistently for 16 years. Uh, they ask us, usually purchasing, uh, for some pound of flesh, and we just say no. And we've just said no consistently for 16 years. And so the tricky part about the enterprise advocates is if you are a sales rep, because they are a sales rep, they're trying to help the customer sort of buy something that's important to them and important to us. Um, they, can't really, they can't really inflect the customer's timing. And so it's very difficult to give them a personal quota, right? And so uh, that team operates on kind of a team target with channel. Uh, and they're uh, not individually compensated. They're, they share the same company bonus plan. And, and so there's other success metrics that we measure them by in the same way that if I'm a product manager or product marketing manager or uh, I run events, I've got things that determine whether or not I do a good job. But my compensation isn't tied to how well I do my job, in part because I just have no levers. Mm -hmm. I have no levers to infect it other than being working hard and being a, a really good Atlassian and being persuasive with the customer and being attentive. 
Back on the channel for a second, do you have channel reps? Uh, we have channel managers that are okay. regional. And they, they're not, they don't have quotas either? Uh, they, they have sort of regional targets, okay. not quotas. They're also, everybody is basically shares the same company plan, Got which it. is based on, um, on a bookings goal um, currently. And so like we're all, we're all in the same boat. And uh, you know, I think we, we believe really early on. It's like you know, it's it's uh, it, it's it, like when I when I think about sales reps, uh, you know, I want them. It's it difficult to say like I'm going to pay you disproportionately more than I would pay an an 10x engineer mm -hmm. or uh, a 10x marketer. Um, and and it's uh, I I know why, and I think in some models like that absolutely works. In ours, it wouldn't. Do you, what is the profile of the rep that you hire, though? Is it, is it consistent with what the enterprise rep would look like at a BEA or an Oracle or places you look No, no, no. These are, or is it completely different psychological? The, the, I think a closest proxy would be a, a, you know, a traditional inside rep. I mean, these are folks that are kind of in their, maybe it's a first job. They're in kind of their, you know, their mid to late 20s, uh, maybe early 30s. Uh, I think they're a less uh, kind of cutthroat hungry. They, they, they may want to build a sales career, and I think people that want to build a sales career in software uh, maybe cut their teeth a little bit at Lassian and figure out what our model looks like and then go somewhere else because yeah. we just don't have the, the, you know, we don't have that avenue for them. Mm -hmm. um, but people who are really customer oriented, who are attentive, who we're like, we have reasonably technical products, and so I think they want to learn, you know, how to talk about a technical product. Um, they don't trap, nobody travels. Uh, you know, it's and like no quota, no travel. Yeah, it's a good life. It's a, it, uh, part of it sounds a little bit like a customer success orientation. You know, it's, it's a CSAT really, as being kind of the primary KPI. It's really close. It's really close so. to that. Yeah. yeah. Let's. Let, that was great. So I'm sure there are probably going to be some questions in the Q and A section about sales. But switching gears to product, another really unconventional thing you guys have done since inception is you've been a, a multi-product company, and one of the. Um, again, patterns that most of us in the investor world think is that it's hard enough to build a company with a single product in a single market, let alone try and do that across two or three products. What was some of the thinking in the early days to kind of go to market with multiple products, potentially you know, have your energy distributed across yeah. a lot of, of different use cases? I mean, that's just, just, it compounds the complexity even more. So what was the thinking for, for going to product with so many I think it was, with so many it, was, it was literally we just, uh, early on, we, we just had an itch to scratch and uh, we scratched it. And, and so like we had Jira, I think Jira began to take off. Uh, they, this is before my time, a couple of years, but uh, there was a bunch of uh, crappy alternatives, you know, kind of crappy open source wikis that um, I think the founders didn't like. And so one of them cobbled together an alternative to that and had a couple of developers and, you know, we were maybe like 12 people at the time, 10 people at the time, just sort of work on it on the side. Uh, again, counter to any kind of conventional guidance or wisdom. Uh, but uh, a really important thing that we did because like early on, we began to build muscle around um, cross sell and cross flows and priorities, right? Like how, how do you, when you think about man, there's only so many people we can hire, where do they go? And, and uh, how do we choose one thing over another? And that sort of, like a lot of that, that kind of discipline and sort of um, thinking about strategy and planning and, and comes a, a, a lot later when you actually need a second act or you need some other thing to kind of fill the void of decelerating growth. Uh, and, and so I think early on, we just, we built this discipline of, of uh, you know, of, of kind of building out different capability in different products. And now the way we think about our business is one way we talk about it. Some of you may have heard me uh, describe this before, but we sort of think about, you know, Lassian is this, you know, hillside of snow. And like our job is, uh, is to stand at the top of the hill and ro roll more snowballs down it. Um, and so we do that with confluence and with sort of new things that we introduce. The other, sorry, the other job is to steepen the slope of of, or you know, steep in the slope of the of the, the the hill, and so those balls roll roll faster. And we do that with with pricing. We do that with uh, with packaging and and SKUs. We do that with uh, that sort of discipline around um, around you know growth, uh, kind of in product and improving activation rates and engagement rates and conversion rates and sort of all the things that many of you are doing. Those things all work. That that when you get a step function change. 
or even a significant improvement in any of those things that I mentioned, that's like you've steepened the slope for all the other snowballs that you're going to run down because you're better at that particular thing going forward. And so that's how we think about it. We think about the way that our business will continue to scale is snowballs and steeper slopes. Got it. And you, you didn't feel, even in the early days, granted you weren't there for the first five years, but you know, when you did join, there were, it didn't feel overwhelming. It didn't feel like you, were, you guys were trying to do too much from a product perspective. Uh, it's, it's always felt that way. Okay. Yeah, it's always, it's hard uh, it, because, you know, we're, we're ambitious and, you know, we think of, there's a lot of things that we want to do and you can't do all of them all at once. And I think like, you know, every company's, every company kind of goes through some, you know, the, uh, how you think about priorities and what you choose to do and what you can't afford to do now, what you defer for later. And, uh, you know, I don't know that we, we've done okay. Uh, with, with those choices. We don't probably get all of them right. Um, but even now, if you look at where we are and kind of the, we're in a lot of places, like we've got a lot of competitors, we're in a lot of markets, we're doing a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, we just uh, acquired one of your companies. Thank you for uh, that. We're very grateful. Uh, Ops Genie. So we've, we've got, you know, big bets in, in IT that we're making. And, uh, and you know, it, it's, uh, it's it, that, that, that getting the discipline of, of, of choosing all those things and trying to get them all lined up right. And especially when you come down to so like a public company, it's a little bit harder because like you've got to be super thoughtful about uh, where all your dollars go, dollars go and what you get back because you have um, shareholders that you didn't pick um, that, that, uh, that you need to explain that stuff to. But it's, uh, yeah. Got it. So let's, let's segue to international. You guys have been international from day one, really, having you know, kind of built the company initially in Australia. Um, many of the, the entrepreneurs and leaders in the audience are either in the middle of, of starting to go international or are you know, international now with multiple offices, either developers overseas, building up sales operations overseas. What, what were some of the lessons learned that you guys kind of experienced as you scaled the business, both um, you know, as you kind of left Australia, but then as you've kind of built both engineering and, and kind of revenue or different types of operations in, in other offices? Yeah, well, I mean, the one kind of one key ingredient for, for international growth with us was just the way I described the model. The fact that we focused on distributing the product and, and, and kind of built a go-to-market model over the web meant that we were accessible to anyone, to anyone, right? And, uh, uh, you, you know, the, 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 there's the English speaking markets account for like, you know, 75% of enterprise IT spend. I might have that figure right, but it's massive. Like, you know, Canada, Australia, UK, the US, um, uh, we sell to developers. And so that was also kind of the key ingredient because uh, most developers uh, speak English really well. So that kind of early audience for us, we could literally sell anywhere, and we didn't have to worry too much about translation. But it was easier for us to go international because in our model, we didn't have to hire an agent or a rep or a sales team. Um, everything was basically just from central command. Uh, and I guess my only advice, like having, having we, we got a really healthy international business, is um, you know, uh, focus and and less less can be more. I mean, I think like. 26 countries account for like 96% of, of dollars spent on uh, enterprise software. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so if, if you constrain yourself to the big ones, like, and some of them are harder than others, um, but you can just cover a lot of ground. And so yeah. you know, we focus on, when we think, think about um, kind of translation and, and kind of building a localized product, uh, in our tier one, there's really only six languages. That's it. It's like the figs, Japan and Korea, uh, and uh, simplified Chinese, which is a longer, maybe a longer conversation about. But uh, that's it. And there's like tiers two and below. Um, you know, there's still customers there, and so we do lightweight translation, but uh, not as big of an investment. The other thing I would say that we've learned is, and we're really thoughtful about how deep we go, because um, uh, you know we don't do support in local language. We only support you in English, and so. Uh, we want to make sure that the demarcation point that we don't pretend to be a French speaking company. If, you know, if I uh, translate all of the marketing collateral and the documentation and all the onboarding emails in product and you, you know, you can buy in euros and basically every marketing, you know, email that you get is in French. 
uh, the minute you need help and you write in French and we don't speak it, I think it's a bit disingenuous. And so we've been really thoughtful about where we let people know that, that uh, there's some lightweight superficial French translation and the product actually is located in fr or localized in French, but everything else that we, we do is English because you're going to interface with us through mm -hmm. English. Got it. So uh, just a heads up, we'll do Q&A in, in a couple minutes here. Uh, so if you've got a question, just be prepared and the mics will be available. Um, just one more on international. When, when we got together recently, you shared an interesting story about kind of scaling a developer operation overseas that like based on all the metrics looked awesome. There was like deep talent pool and you know not a lot of other people recruiting there, but still it didn't work out. So what were, what were some of the lessons learned from that? So we looked for a remote development site and just you know a pool of, of engineering talent that we could tap into uh, that was maybe less competitive and uh, a little bit more economical. And so we did looked around the world and and uh, did like this really complicated matrix that sort of um, you know scored all these different places and settled on Vietnam. And the reason we chose Vietnam, by the way, is because they have really strong uh, um, computer science and STEM, uh, just generally STEM education at a really early age. Uh, the, the, the culture also is incredibly loyal, like a lot of uh, the Vietnamese live at home and support their families, and so there isn't a lot of job hopping. There was a couple of factors that we felt were um, pretty valuable to us as a hire. And so we went into Vietnam, um, set up an office, ramped really quickly to 120 engineers. And, uh, and those engineers, like we do an uh, annual uh, kind of, or sort of quarterly hackathon, and I think in the first four quarters, um, they won it three or four times. So like really high quality talent. The thing that we didn't uh, anticipate, we didn't think through, is um, managers of, uh, of talent as we scaled. So we got to about 150, and then we couldn't find anyone in the country that had experience uh, leading you know, dev teams of 15, 25, 30. And that was going to be a problem, because potentially the site would not be 150. Capped at 150 would be 1,000. And uh, there aren't a lot of experienced dev managers. There are a lot of experienced dev managers around the world, not many that would want to move to Vietnam. So uh, another hard, we shut down the site. Like we imported uh, into, Aust into Australia as many of them as we could, uh, as the Australian government would let us. But that was also a hard decision. That was a number of years ago. But uh, you know, closing a site and actually telling people, um, uh, you know, you, you, don't, you no longer have a job here in part because of, you know, mistakes that we've made in calculating what, this, what, what we could actually do here uh, is hard. But again, you do it with honesty and candor and you treat people with respect and, you know, we're going to make mistakes. But I think it's how we, um, how we sort of learn from them and, and then uh, treat people uh, that are affected by them that matter. Yeah, that's a great lesson. Um, okay, so it's Q&A time. If you have a question, raise your hand, and we have a couple of mics available. Hi, how you doing? Over here. Hey. hey. Uh, yeah, so no salespeople, right? You said you had the product advocates and the enterprise advocates. I got that right? How do yeah. you... I mean, they are salespeople. Yeah. They're, they're, a, they're a little bit different salesperson. Right, they're... right. But so my question is, if they're not... Uh, obviously, how do you measure and incentivize? Can you talk a little bit more about how you measure and incentivize their activity? Because obviously, you don't want them to be traditional salespeople, right? You want them to be a different. You're, 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 you've created a new, a new role. It sounds like. Can you talk a little more about how you incentivize that and how you how you measure the out the the the, uh, the performance of that unit? Yeah. So the product advocates are measured by that's that reactive team that uh, that basically is measured by kind of volume and CSAT. And so the number of people that we can help, and when we ask people, how was your experience of getting help from us, uh, and, and what is your, your sort of the satisfaction score that you get, or the NPS of the interactions that people have with you. So that's product advocates. Enterprise advocates are, are measured by, I mean, they have, a, they have a target. Like we have uh, you know, a certain number, number, number of customers that they're trying to get to, to upgrade up this expansion path. And so, uh, and you know, like we'll do the typical things that many of you do with your sales teams. We'll look at activity and, and uh, kind of effectiveness, but there is a target. There's like a, there's a, you know, there's, there's a sales, there's a number of sales. The, the, the hard thing about it is, is when you take out, like I mentioned, when you take out the ability to discount and the ability to sort of offer anything to the customer, you, you can't really influence timing. And so it's difficult to say, uh, you need to do, you know, pick a number, you need to do half a million dollars this quarter, because the customer is going to say, you know, what's in it for me? If you need it by, you know, June, June, May 31st, 
it, it, you know, like, let me know what you, what you need. And so we've, we've sort of, you know, we've taken the ability for any individual to influence the customer's timing. And so it ends up being kind of a, they can influence the overall, that overall business uh, by identifying opportunities and sort of doing some of the things that just traditional reps do. The thing that they don't do is, in, is negotiate. But they are like, they are measured on, you know, on, on, uh, on a sales number. Hi. Um, here? Hello? Oh, hey. <laughs> Erwan from Elastify. Obviously, probably a lot of go-to-market questions for many of us in enterprise software here. You have a pretty amazing model. Being a customer and a happy one, and being, being confronted to the, uh, no, no, we don't talk about the price uh, type moment. So that's, that's a unique customer experience. Can you talk a little bit more about the channel? You said we're very friendly with the channel. How does that food chain work? I mean, your, your pricing's published. You're very well known for not touching it and never modifying it. So what's in there for the channel? How does that work? Are they booting firms who add value because they can help customers deploying, yep. taking advantage? How does that channel play work? So the channel, channel gets margin if they resell. I think it's like 25 points on, a, on a, an initial first year subscription or a new license and then 10 points on renewal. Um, and so it's, uh, I think it's pretty generous. At our price points, there you're not going to be able to, to build uh, a really big business just on reselling Atlassian. And so what's in it for them is services and consulting. That's sort of the bulk of, of our, uh, our channel are, um, are you know, value-added resellers. There's, there's sort of services or solutions, and either that's kind of customizing, tweaking, doing business consultancy. For the behind the firewall stuff, they can do the installation and the upgrade and kind of the ongoing maintenance of that. And, and they're going you know, to build kind of the, a book of business and a relationship with a customer that way. Oh, yeah. If what, I'm a channel, the, am I going to make 75% of my business adding value with my guys, my consultants, my localization, my local language support, and 25% uh, reselling? Or is it, a, I mean, roughly, what's the mix? I, I think they probably make, uh, you know, somewhere between eight, eight to ten times in, in consulting and services that they, than they do on, on license sales. No. Thank um, you. And again, you know, they... they they're really good at building long-term relationships with the customers. So they might do like an initial deployment, uh, but uh, you know that customer is going to invite them back to do a bunch of other stuff because they they're a trusted advisor. Hi, I'm here. I'm Gina with Nitro, fellow Aussie company. Um, we also good eye. Have multiple good eye. Well, I'm Irish, so. All right. The, the original Aussie. Um, we, we also have multiple, um, multiple offices, multiple locations across, you know, pretty much every most awkward time zone that exists. Um, I was just wondering how you guys have, you know, effectively managed um, communication and collaboration, both kind of at an all hands level, but, yeah. but also day to day. Yeah, so it's changed over time. So first of all, we are uh, massive users, users of our own products. I was going to say, there's this product called Jira. Yeah, whether it's in confluence. I mean, I, I think if, uh, I would say if, if I gave anyone in the room, if you're CEOs or founders, demo, a, a demonstration of how we use confluence, uh, it, it, would, it would blow your mind. Because you just can't, uh, you know, you can't do with Google Docs what you can do with Confluence or Quip or Dropbox Paper or anything. It, it just becomes this live, living, breathing, you know, the company is manifest inside of this place that, you know, we create and share information. And, you know, a, a big part of our, our kind of our, our brand and our belief is around openness. And so Confluence begins, if you use it, with a page that everybody can see as opposed to Google Doc, Docs, which is a page that only you can see and you have to decide who you want to share it with. And that's a really important inversion, right? Because when you start, you have to be comfortable being open. But when you start with just a draft or something that's open and everybody can see it, and you have a culture that's sort of built around around that that idea, which is which is really important. Uh, magical things happen, and so that's sort of one kind of one core thing is the way we use, especially Confluence, but Jira too. It's just these open collaborative systems where you know work is resident there, and people know how to shape it and contribute to it and discover it and do all those sorts of things. Uh, and then from a from a, a communication perspective, we do um, we've evolved. This has changed over time, but now we do a weekly thirty minute town hall that is live streamed. And uh, we get, I think, 
Uh, regularly, most of the offices, except for Amsterdam, which is our European headquarters, and uh, they, they're usually asleep um, when we do it, but we cover everybody else. And uh, there's usually like a, it's a common, you know, kind of uh, format for, you know, just a quick up company update from uh, leadership and then some rotation of important projects or updates from various parts of the company. And there's a group that programs that. And so they've, they've got the cadence down of going and soliciting a bunch of ideas from other parts of the business and scrambling speakers together. Um, and yeah, and so that's live streamed and you know, every office basically can watch it from your desk or you watch it live in a bunch of kind of uh, gathering points inside of physical offices. Cool, thank you. We're just, for, just to add to that, I have a couple companies that every Friday morning publish an email. They're not even that big. I mean, they're you know, 100, 150 employees, just kind of summary of everything going on. Board gets copied on. It's a great way to actually stay in touch. Low, lightweight, low touch. Yeah. So. I'm Stephanie Phone with Rundeck. My question is, what's it like for the organization having co-CEOs? That's quite atypical. Yeah. It's... Uh... It, I think overall it's good. Uh, it depends on how, how close you get to them, maybe. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, I always say they're, they're very practiced at it. I mean, they've been doing it now. We're 16 years old. They've been doing it uh, for 16 years. Uh, they, um, you know, they're both insanely bright, uh, talented leaders. Uh, both have deep empathy, which I think is important as a CEO. And I think they're very thoughtful about um, about uh, kind of alignment and and uh, in the dynamic uh, that can maybe be confusing if people misinterpret it, um, and you know I think they've divided responsibilities in kind of logical ways over the years that that uh, help help uh, people understand that there's a single accountability owner in some of these areas, and so and they're they're you know they trust each other deeply, and so they don't need to do a lot of of let's let's confer on this decision. Um, I've got this thing that I'm running, and you trust me to make hard decisions. Uh, and I think the, the other thing that we do is we've been really thoughtful as a company about creating kind of decision systems and, uh, and helping understand, like, what are, um, you know, if there's a decision that's, that we talk about the kind of the one-way, two-way door framework, where if there's a decision that's, that's a, a one-way door, you can't turn around and go back, out it, back through if you screwed it up that that's a decision that we talk a lot about, like end of life in a product. That's a one-way door decision. You can't pull back from that. Um, but there's a lot of two-way door decisions where, man, if we screw something up, you know, we can just turn around, come back through, regroup, and do it over again. And then the other uh, framework that we try, we try to use broadly in the company is uh, kind of the, you know, the tree decision framework. Have you guys seen that? Where it's, it's basically like um, uh, root, trunk, branch, leaf. And uh, a leaf decision, and this is a, a frame, framework that we use to, to help kind of decision and communication between manager and employee. A leaf decision is a decision that you make, uh, you being uh, an employee, not a manager. Uh, the employee makes, and as a manager, I don't need to know about it. You just make it, um, away you go. Uh, a, a, a branch decision is a decision you make and you tell me about it, I need to be informed. Uh, a trunk decision is one that we make together. And then a uh, root decision is one that I make and you give me options. And, and so we use that pretty regularly. It's, it's really effective, and you can probably find blog posts about it, but it's really effective in, uh, in setting up autonomy and expectation. So if you sit down with your team and you're like, all these things, we've got to make decisions, and these are the leaves and these are the branches, people can run a lot faster because they know when they need to come back to you and say, you know, either you make this and I'm, I'm informing you, or I make it, I'm informing you, or you're making it, and I'm, I'm kind of shaping it with you. Um, hi. I'm, um, I'm just wondering if you ever look back and think what would have happened if you went more traditional enterprise sales route. Yeah, all the time. Um, it's hard. You know, like, we, we do a lot of experimentation around it, and we have over the years. And so we'll say, man, if we take a group of people and we really apply them at every trial and we do kind of the traditional thing, what's the, what is the, the difference in conversion rate? What's the difference in sort of like how many products are loaded in the basket at the same, like what, what is the effect? And uh, it, 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 at least in our business with who, who, who we're selling to 
and uh, our price points, it hasn't been pronounced enough for us to actually choose to, to, do, to do a different path. And then I think the other thing is that we are, our model is, is really about deferring greed, which is very unconventional. Um, we are a flywheel, and we have a relatively steady run rate uh, as a business that is very durable and very predictable. And, and I think when you introduce more traditional sales energy, you disrupt that, especially if you allow discounting. And especially if you motivate um, kind of individual people to prioritize their own individual incentive compensation over the long-term durability of the company. And you give them the ability to do that. They will all day long. And you know, one of my favorite, there's two favorite charts that are in our, our kind of S1, our S1 pro, you know, uh, uh, document from the IPO. One was, um, you know, they're, they're, it showed basically customers that grew with us over 10 years. And they started at like a $2,000 purchase. And at like the five year mark, you know, they may be at like $500,000 a year. And I always, I always like to think, man, if that customer came to me and said, and they, they would all the time, I want to do a three year deal. Like what three year deal would you do? Um, and if you fast forward five years, those same companies are spending $2 million a year. And I think we never would have anticipated that continued growth. We would have we would have, you know, we would have basically mortgaged a future that we grew into over time. And we probably would have had a bigger year six, but I don't think year 10 or year 11 or year 12 would have been as, as, as big. And the other, my other favorite chart, which is, which is a super valuable one, is we, we show um, in our business kind of bookings and billings linearity, not revenue, sales, like the, the rate at which sales in a given quarter comes in. And every quarter is basically, so you know, it's, it's up to 100% of what you're gonna do in a given quarter. And ours is a straight line that just goes from, from you know, zero dollars on, on day one of the quarter all the way up to 100% on day, uh, you know, day 90. And, and every one is the same, like it's ruler straight. And the reason is because we don't create any artificial events for the, like they're just, they're buying when they're ready and they may ask us for a discount and we say no and then they, you know, they may wait a little while and they just buy. And so like it's a steady rate of business. And the benefit as a leader of the company is that, that there's nothing I can do to change the outcome of Atlassian's quarter. That wouldn't be grossly irresponsible, right? If, if we're gonna really miss, the only thing we could do is do what sales reps do, which is like broadcast some big discount to a bunch of people that would rob a bunch of, of next quarter's revenue and pull it forward. And so there's nothing I can really do about a quarter. And so the CEOs and me, like we don't, you know, we, we're not focused on this quarter. We're not really focused on next quarter. We're focused on five quarters from now and six quarters from now. Like what do we de need to do now to make sure that that next year is durable and predictable? And that's, that's a, an awesome thing. Cause you know, in a traditional models, there's wonderful traditional models at work, but a lot of them, um, you kind of get into this rhythm of, of, of anxiety around what's going to happen in the particular quarter and what can you do in that last three weeks. And I, I think that creates a lot of uh, bad behaviors for the long term. I don't think anybody in the room knows anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> All of our sales linearity is just like that. Very predictable. Any other questions that folks have? Cool. This will be our last one, I think. We don't want to keep you away from your drinks much longer. I'll make it quick. My name is Omar Talakul, CEO of Voicera. Uh, when you think about the trade-offs that you make in product early on when you're introducing a collaborative product, um, there's some work people do for growth, things like your LinkedIn and you connect to the address book so you can add more users. And then there's features that you do just to make the quality better and so on. Can you speak a little bit about, about the balance you achieve early on in, in product cycles that do collaboration? Uh, in terms of what we invest to make, what we invest for existing customers over new customers or? I'm, you know, there are people out there who really focus on growth hacking will say take 50% of your, your roadmap and just focus it on the growth features. Things that get more users to jump on and share and stuff like that. Um, uh, d what do you think uh, is the right balance early on? More on the quality of the product or more on the growth hacking? Yeah, I would say, um, so we really didn't invest in growth until we were probably, I don't know, like seven or eight years old. And, and so it was maybe a, a later stage investment for us. And it, it, be, it, it became a very critical one because, um, you know, we, were, we, needed, we had some catching up to do. Uh, but I think, um, you know, we focused and we still focus a lot of energy on, on just shoring up the foundation of the product and making it better and more appealing. You know, if you look at Jira, like Jira, 
um, you know, Jira just had a, a massive significant update, and there's a lot more stuff that we're working on. And this is a product that's 16 years old. And you know, Jira today doesn't look at all and function at all like it did two years ago, and it won't look or function at all like it, like it does today two or four or five years later, and we have to do that in order to, to be around um, you know, 10 years from now. So I think there's a super heavy influ influence on, on constantly improving the product and innovating and, and, and improving and you know, all the paper cuts that probably a lot of you experience if you use it very often. Like we're motivated to get as many of those out of the way. And at the same time, like there is a pretty significant investment in kind of the virality and expansion paths that are available to us because they're, they're valuable. Thank you. Great. Jay, thanks so much. That yeah. was super insightful. Thank you, guys. Thanks. <laughs>